the Chips Avengers assemble once again. Rave Gujan of the Rhodium Group, JP Kleinens of, of the European Think Tank SNV, Jay Goldberg of Digits and Dollars, and Dylan Patel, who writes the semi analysis Substack, here to talk about Chips Act, Tech Cold War, uh, Euro Chips Act, AI, China Retaliation, Autonomous Driving, and whatever else we get into. Welcome to China Talk, everyone. So, a few weeks ago, the CHIPS Act released its first request for funding. So the entire global semiconductor industry who's interested in getting money to make manufacturing in America now has their guidelines of what they're going to have to submit in order to hopefully come away with millions or even potentially billions of dollars in support for building in the U.S. What were everyone's impressions of that document? What do the priorities seem to be about what the administration is most focused on trying to get built in the U.S.? To me, it seemed like a lot of the priorities are around leading edge and packaging, um, advanced packaging, and maybe not so much a traditional packaging and you know trailing edge process technology, at least it seemed like. I mean, it certainly are going to be, you know, certainly as efforts in that direction. But it, it, to me, it just felt like they were a lot more concerned about the leading edge, which is you know, just an interesting uh, thread to go down. Yeah, when they say two leading edge networks or hubs, that's a lot of money. And and getting, you know, two places in America up and running on the leading edge is like committing a not insubstantial portion of the $40 billion, which is going to be up for grabs. My sense was that they're still kind of leaving their options open and there almost weren't a ton of choices that were made in this document. It kind of listed like everything that you could think of them ever wanting to do. So I, you know, you saw leading edge, you saw lagging edge, you saw packaging and like the sort of hierarchy of needs was was just, you know, we want you to address national security and economic objectives. And you don't really you don't really have like the rubric of like we're giving 50% to leading edge and like, you know, 50% to everything else. You didn't quite get all the way to that level of thinking. Anyways, Jay, did anything strike out to you about this sort of broad funding priorities? Yeah, I mean it it, it looked to me a lot like a, a policy document as opposed to a technology document. It, it, didn't, it didn't strike me that it was like really clear strategic on which technologies really matter. But I mean, there, there is an interesting like negotiation dynamic thing here. When you say, you know, 100%, I want leading edge and nothing else. Then all of a sudden the TSMCs and Samsung of the world, their bargaining position all of a sudden gets a lot better, right? Yeah, but that, that, that again, is, is speaks to almost a political dynamic where it's like they clearly negotiated a bunch of deals ahead of it for TSMC and for some of the others. And, and that's why those are seem prominent. It's not from a sort of best practices technology perspective. It's just like, hey, we have this deal. L let's make sure that there's language in the policy that covers deals we've already closed. And then everything else is sort of like, here's our, here's our priority list. I think they didn't negotiate because they say two leading edge fabs, right? Well, Samsung's got a huge announcement in Texas, right? Intel's got a huge announcement in Ohio, and, and uh, TSMC's got a huge you know, announcement in Arizona. And so all three of those could be significantly pared back or you know, actually go through depending on how these negotiations go through. So I don't actually think they negotiated these deals yet, right? I think they're going to play each other off of them. And in the end, one of the, one of the three will maybe not get the money that they want um, or will not come up to bat. Because I think all three are leveraging for you know, as much chips act as possible, right? I, I think that's true. I also I also think some of them might not actually take the deal. I think, you know, I have to look at Samsung, who's already committed a lot of this before the Chips Act, and they start looking at this. Are, are they really going to be? I don't. I'm not sure they're going to be excited about it or want to take that money, which would be an interesting choice. They're, they're leaking stuff to Reuters, right? Yesterday, I think they got Reuters to say that the costs went up by you know X percent. Uh, it was like five billion dollars or something, right? Versus what they had planned a couple of years ago. So I think. That's, that's just more negotiation leverage that they're trying to put out there, I imagine. So, so Reva, like, you know, we, we have money, but there are also many, many strings attached that these companies are going to have to weigh whether or not they want to take the CHIPS Act money. What were some of the more dramatic or potentially more costly asks that the CHIPS Act is going to make on these companies that are considering taking this money? Yeah, from a policy perspective... Industrial policy provides a fantastic opportunity for governments to impose conditions on industry. And you can see that in the language of the CHIPS Act and in the provisions that we see coming out now in this implementation phase. Uh, so one 
line that really stood out is um, on the clawback provision, which said that commerce can clawback funding if recipients, quote, knowingly engage in any joint research or technology licensing effort with foreign entities of concern that raise national security concerns. That's obviously very broad. And the Secretary of Commerce has the remit to interpret that, uh, adjust that definition over time. And that should make companies, of course, nervous, right? Samsung and SK Hynix are already in a really uncomfortable position just being beholden to BIS licenses to continue operating their fabs in China. And the, the signal has already been sent, right? Steer your leading edge memory chip production out of China. You're on a timeline. Go. So I think part of the reticence you're seeing from companies like Samsung is, well, how how tight are these conditions going to be? How will that U.S. interpretation evolve over time? And then you see, you know, TSMC is like, yeah, no, this is all very reasonable. Um, we're we're good. We're we're going to go for it, right? So it's it's really interesting to see kind of middle power balancing manifested through these companies' policies as they're reacting to what's coming out. Sure, sure. So there is there's a provision in the Chips Act that that basically says that um, any excess profits would be shared with the government, uh, which is is very interesting because I don't I mean I don't know policy, but I don't think that's happened a lot with prior sort of subsidies to companies in various industries that the government has uh, the U.S. government has subsidized. So like, what's up with that? Yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I I read that as they they pasted that that on in the last minute because it emerged that the Euro Chips Act had those provisions in it. And I, I, I think some of the U.S. policymakers thought, oh, yeah, we should have that too. That sounds like a good idea. Actually, the depending on your reading, um, I would say in some of the provisions in Europe are even a little bit more drastic. So in, in, in one subsidy vehicle, it is negotiated that for companies, they, they have to make the, the financial gap analysis and tell the government this is kind of the, the delta that we are looking at and this is uh, why we need subsidies. And then some governments argue that, well, obviously you have a lot of leeway with this financial gap analysis because if you calculate extremely conservatively how profits will develop in your market, then your financial gap analysis might be extremely big even though the market is uh, extremely profitable for you. So over the seven year period that the, the subsidies are going out, if your profit is above a certain percent, you have to pay back the entirety of the subsidy. So suddenly companies have to put back money or put aside money because depending on how the market develops, they might have to pay back all of the of the subsidies that they have received, and um, I mean this is definitely an interesting situation. I think for companies where you receive subsidies, but you at the same time you have to put aside money because if the, if your investment is too profitable and if the market develops too nicely, you might have to pay back uh, all of those subsidies. How have companies responded to that on the European side so far, Jan Peter? I mean, interestingly, th th there's there's not a huge discussion about it in Europe on the public level, uh, and, but there's a very mm, active conversation among member states because, as always in Europe, member states differ on their perception of how subsidies should be used, how stringent the rules should be, and so on. So to use a cliche, you can imagine that the more frugal Scandinavian countries are more opposed to the idea to just give away subsidies freely and want to have strings attached in terms of profit margins, whereas other countries, including the one where I'm sitting, uh, have a different idea of how to give away subsidies to companies. It's a little bit of a mess, but it's interesting to see that for this particular regard, apparently, as Jay put it, the U.S. government got maybe some inspiration from Europe which is definitely interesting. Maybe just as a side note um, to, the, to the previous conversation, for me, uh, kind of the big underlying question in all of this, because Jay, you mentioned before that for you, it read more like a policy document and less like a technology document. For me, the underlying question is, to what extent can governments be reasonable technology pickers? Right? Because ultimately, if you look at industrial policy and in the implementation of the US Chips Act, the implementation of the EU Chips Act, Governments want to be 
the winning technology pickers, right? And, and I'm just simply like looking at the financial sector and how tricky it is to pick a winning technology for VC. I'm just wondering how the government's best placed to make decisions, for example, should we subsidize the silicon carbide fab or should we subsidize the gallium nitride fab or what's up with all the analog processors for AI? Should we give subsidies to chip design for analog processors or is it really about wafer level packaging or like is government in the right place to make those rather intricate and long-term um, decisions on the technology level when the sector itself already struggles to identify winning technologies in the long term? My, my knee-jerk reaction to that is, is, is no, but if you think historically, there have certainly been a lot of instances in which, which the U.S. government has had a, a techno technologically savvy policy towards tech, you know, what technologies to prefer. And usually it's, it's rooted in some basic need of the government, right, around, usually around you know, defense and military. And so I'm just wondering to what extent some of these priorities are reflected in the latest in the, in the CHIPS Act. Because certainly... The, the chip sanctions back in October were clearly heavily in, influenced by the Defense Department and adjacent agencies. I, I don't get the sense from this latest document around the CHIPS Act, you know, this sector of the U.S. economy or the U.S. government needs this technology and we're going to favor it. It, it. it feels broader to me. And, and I think that's reflective of it coming out of yeah. commerce, which itself, the Commerce Department doesn't have a big need for advanced chips the way that the Defense Department does. I don't get the sense that we have a clear laundry list of technologies that we need. But it can evolve over time, right? I mean, that's part of the the design of this is to, you know, stay ahead in that innovation curve. I mean, we'll see how how that evolves, but the the trailing edge policy debate still seems to be very much in play. I mean, yes, the emphasis is on leading edge, but you've still got 10 billion for for legacy chip manufacturing there's still big gaps there of course policymakers want to steer sourcing away from china that's hard to do just given market dynamics but it's interesting to see where some emerging policy areas are are cropping up too to try to address that for example in demanding more transparency on subsidy disclosure this is where the eu is already a couple of steps ahead of the us uh, in throwing up procurement investment restrictions around subsidy uh, driven dist market distortions. The U.S. is playing around with that now, too. So there, there are still ways for the U.S. to, I think, try to steer some of that policy and diversification, although it's, again, the economics of this is, is really hard for U.S. Company, companies to reconcile with. But it's this flexibility built into these latest policies. And my, my question is, do we think that's a feature or a bug? Because... The, 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 you know, the glass half full version is like what you said, which is they're going to sort of adapt with time depending on needs. The glass half empty view of that is they don't really know what they want and it's going to become down to sort of backroom deals and last minute horse trading as opposed to a coherent policy objective. You got to have a sense that there's been more strategy thinking within the CHIPS Act than just what we saw in the vision document and the, the notice of funding opportunity. Yeah, a side question to this. What's your reading? To what extent? I mean, in in Europe, the conversation about subsidizing chips from the beginning was focused on front end and very much focused on cutting edge front end because that's the stuff we don't have at all. But then over over the the eighteen month or so, it got a little bit more nuanced that policymakers understood. Oh, there's a, this thing called packaging, and oh, there's back end, and packaging is advancing, and then you call it advanced packaging, and maybe we need that. And I still remember in one of the requests for comments from DOC, a couple of U.S. PCB manufacturers also replied and said, you know what, if you're worried about national security, don't forget about us. Uh, and with PCBs, the, uh, printed circuit boards, the interesting thing is actually that China is not lagging behind. Actually, the most cutting edge stuff is in China for P PCBs. And it is more that the U.S. and Europe are way behind in PCB manufacturing. So what's your reading from conversations, also looking at UJ? Hypothetically, if I am a really cool PCB startup or a small PCB company, 
do I get anything out of the CHIPS Act? Because out of the EU one, you don't get anything out. So I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I will say that being a, a, an advanced PCB manufacturer is, is not as exciting as it sounds, right? That's a pretty miserable business. Very low margin, fairly labor intensive, right? And for sort of standard packaging, I don't, I don't know how much that's going to come back to the US. Now, ad, advanced packaging, that's important. And Dylan can talk about this way more than I can. But there's a, you know, it, some of the advanced packaging stuff is super, super uh, hard to do. And it's going to be done by the foundries. But the, the bulk of the business and the place where, where we're really talking about PCBs, that's, that, that's, you know, that business is not coming to the US. Like putting stuff on a board, that's, that's going. If it's not in China, it's going to go to Malaysia. But I mean, at the, at the same time, for me, the weird thing is, since we are all doubling down on national security, if you are worried about national security, the PCB should be of concern to you, right? Like maybe even more so than the 15 billion pro uh, uh, transistors in your cutting edge processor, but hiding or compromising a chip that then ends up on the PCB is much more viable in terms of an attack vector than trying to infiltrate Intel's or NVIDIA's next cutting edge processor and hiding a backdoor uh, among the uh, billions of, of transistors. So I'm just, I'm just, I just find it interesting that for some reason with PCBs, well, the US government forgot to, to, to think about the national security angle. The question is if the policymakers, you know, believe that there is a certain level of minimal minimum production that is in the US or in Europe for various technologies, right? Should we be able to make a you know an advanced NVIDIA AI server and the networking equipment to connect them all together, even if it's a small amount? And and to Jay's point, right, that's not economically viable, right? There's too much labor involved. A front end fab requires very few people and labor is, you know, less than 20% of the cost of a of a final chip. It's all capital, right? And so that's something that maybe makes more sense and is more automated, at least from an economic standpoint. But then are policymakers going to subsidize? Hey, actually, we want to be able to have, you know, 3% of the world or 5% of the world or 10% of the world's PCB manufacturing here. But remember, there are multiple policy tools in play, right? So your industrial policy is your incentive. But then the other huge whopper of a policy that's emerging now, post October 7th, I think the next big thing is now the Restrict Act, which last week was unveiled. Um, Senator Mark Warner is behind this. He's, of course, a very serious player in Congress. And it's really interesting because this is something that focuses on ICT supply chains. Remember, commerce already has ICTS rules in effect, this was something that was introduced on the last day of the Trump administration and then went into effect a little bit after that uh, by the Biden administration where they, they carried through. And we've been waiting to see, OK, will this be fully utilized? The TikTok debate has just catalyzed this. But if you look at the text of the Restrict Act, it is really, really deliberately wide ranging. And it's meant to cover hardware, software, services, you know, just the, the provision of, uh, you know, those those services, anything around ICT supply chains that has a nexus with a foreign entity of concern. So, you know, to your point, and Peter, on, OK, well, what about, you know, printed circuit boards and the national security risk? Well, this is the catch all for something like that, potentially. I'm struggling to think of a significant domestic PCB maker. And I'm sure I'm going to get some angry comment. I forgot somebody, but I don't think there is a constituency in the U S who's advocating for this because we, we, I don't think we make many of them any PCBs anymore. So, so maybe so coming up from PCBs for a second, you know, every single company at any point in the value chain is going to do the sort of thing that you know, whichever PCB manufacturer, you know, hired a smart lobbyist to, to help them frame their thing as a national security perspective, such as uh, to, to get JP and Jay and us talking about this on China Talk. And the, you know, having to sort of sift through all of those hundreds, I mean, potentially even like thousands of, of companies that are going to be asking for support saying, look, Maybe you weren't maybe you weren't aware of this, but like our thing is really important to national security. So like give me a slice of the pie. 
And I'm sure there's actually going to be a lot of learning and and, and processing. And, and interestingly, in the NOFO as well, there was a lot of like like room for back and forth where, you know, they would send like an initial 20 pages and then the Commerce Department would say, oh, we want to learn more about this, that and the other thing. So, I mean, I imagine over that iterative process, there, there will be, you know, maybe priorities that that the government will get convinced of. Um, that aren't necessarily the ones that policymakers have already kind of internalized around, say, leading edge logic, for instance. Should we talk about childcare for a second? I mean, the, yeah, the the interesting thing about that is those provisions that got thrown in on on childcare have kind of reopened some of the the partisan vibes around this, uh, you know, where the Republicans are saying, wait, wait, you can't just throw that in there. I thought there was some consensus around this. Like how how many standards do you want to pile on? Then there's, of course, a legitimate argument about, you know, what kind of labor standards the U.S. wants to lead with here. But then you've got Morris Chang over here and TSMC saying, oh, my God, the labor cost is so expensive to produce in China and in the U.S. and globalization is dead. But, you know, this is the new world we live in. So, I mean, it's I, I don't think it stops this in its tracks or anything. It's just a revealing kind of political element to to the policy evolution. Yeah. I mean, you spend money and you're going to push as far as you can and you're going to get some sort of return on your investment from sort of e- economic security, national security, you know, securing the future of the industry, creating an ecosystem or whatever. And like, you know, there are there's a give and take with all of this and maybe It was surprising to me that it made it in there and then it was kind of like the one thing that the national media picked up on with this because we've just been talking for 30 minutes about lots of other things that I think are going to be far more consequential than whether like a thousand employees in the U.S. end up having more subsidized childcare than they would otherwise, which is like important and I, I I think everyone should have childcare in America, but I'm not sure that like the future of America's semiconductor ecosystem is going to hinge on whether or not TSMC's Arizona Fab has like, you know, C plus or A minus preschool. What is tracking to me, and I'm wondering what you're, what you make of this, the Department of Commerce is on a hiring spree for the implementation of the U.S. Chips Act. And some of those hires are really impressive, right? Like the, the, the Department of Commerce got, among others, the chief economist from one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world to now be the chief economist for the implementation of the uh, U.S. Chips Act. These are people who know what they talk about when they talk about chips, right? So I find this pretty impressive in terms of not just talking the talk, writing regulations and paper, but also walking with the walk and trying exactly what you mentioned before, Jordan, how do we spend this money most meaningfully and how do we sift through probably hundreds of applications where some of them might be sketchy? I don't see the same happening in Europe where we, even though the EU Chips Act talks almost about the same amount of money, for, theoretically 43 billion euros, but I don't see a hiring spree in the European Commission. I don't see a hiring spree in member states to kind of step up their game of industry knowledge. So to me, it is, if we compare the two regions, to me, it is really increasingly about who puts the money behind government resources to actually implement all the stuff. So during the uh, Great Depression and the New Deal, there was this sort of new class of dollar a year men, and they were all men back then, who basically came in from industry and, you know, were there to spend all the money that FDR got appropriated to, to rebuild America. And I think it's sort of like, worth acknowledging on the on this podcast that like the the pay cuts that all these people from industry are taking by doing these jobs are like you know factors of five or ten i mean the the cio spent 30 years or something at kkr and he probably isn't making more than 200k to do this job and you know this is this is real this is public service and this is kind of like because our government hasn't figured out how to pay talent appropriately this is sort of what we need to make a make a real national push in a in something where the sort of like 
the alternate employment opportunities are just are just so much more lucrative. So it, it has been really encouraging for me to see the type of folks that the administration has been able to persuade to take some of these opportunities because they're not doing it to get rich. We've talked for 30 minutes. Like these are incredibly difficult things to weigh and trade-offs to make that you can't just figure out by having looked at these things for like a few months and making a decision. Because if you do that, then like the lobbyists will beat you and you won't be able to get the best bang for your buck. So we're recording this on Friday, March 17th. Yesterday, I watched Microsoft's Windows 365 demo like three times and was also just screaming in delight at what these potential applications for Word, Microsoft, Excel, and Outlook could do. Dylan, what's what's your take on how these sorts of applications of, of generative AI can change the world? I mean... The, the the consequences of the world are huge. But I was, you know, all I was thinking about was, you know, hey, like all these applications of AI being pushed forward are huge. There's already a shortage of AI chips from, you know, NVIDIA and such in the market today, even after the China ban, right? Like it's like there's a serious amount of hardware that's needed to run all these applications. For example, if you put large language models in search, you're going to need tens of billions of dollars of GPUs. If you put these large language models into every word I'm typing into Microsoft Word or Excel. Like, what? This is going to be ridiculous amounts of compute needed. And uh, you know, the question is, what what can you what can you run on those? Well, generally the systems are either banned or they're just about at the banning threshold, right? Nvidia modified some of the specs. But as we go forward, you know, there's a real question if if China will even be able to deploy these at anywhere close to the same scale that the U.S. can. And then then that's a question of like, hey, like. Does Microsoft Word and Excel and Outlook and Teams with this AI like meeting like recognition and all? I mean, I, you guys just need to watch this. Everyone needs to watch the Microsoft event. But like, does that make me forty percent more productive? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it absolutely does. So, so if I'm forty percent more productive, does that like close a lot of the gap of you know pure population advantage that China has? Um, and then when you add in allies and such, like it's it's a tremendous question of like, does does large language models and AI like make you know, the whole like China is going to take over the world because they have a bigger country with more people, with more STEM graduates, you know, break that down a little bit. So I took my five-year-old daughter to this event at the University of Texas in Austin. It was a big science event. And they did one of those demos. Have you ever seen where they do the mousetrap demo for an uncontrolled nuclear chain fission reaction? It's really cool. Like they drop a ping pong ball into this box and then it like sets up all the, the mouse traps and it's it's an uncontrolled reaction, like, right? One goes off and then they all go off. And in my head, immediately, I was thinking, holy crap, like, open AI, like, this is what China sees, right? When generative AI is out into the world, right? We, I'm sure it's like all around our dinner tables, all of the discussions going on around, well, what is this going to lead to in this innovation? What business model can emerge out of this? How do, you know, our own companies need to stay ahead of the curve and how can they utilize it? Think about that conversation on the Chinese side, right? Because this is, it's out there. It's out into the world. You need to innovate fast to, to take advantage of it. And as you said, Dylan, you need vast amounts of compute power here. And China has just been cut off from that in a very big way. So all of a sudden, we're just looking at this escalation ladder when this the, the tech controls theme catalyzed to a huge degree, which really makes you wonder at this point what the political decisions are going to be in Beijing. Like, yes, you can come out of the two sessions and say, we got to focus on basic R&D uh, and we, we, we just need to kind of double down and put our resources into this. But these are really hard constraints that you're up against. And if you want your companies to innovate, you can't be all over them to censor these large language models, right? And what they're going to churn out to your populace, it's only going to slow you down even more. So some really hard choices I think are going to need to be made here. And geopolitically, that's a fascinating question to me over the next three years or so. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because when the October 7th restrictions were laid out, it was, look, we're stopping supercomputers to model nuclear bombs or whatever. It was very much like, look, this is a national security thing. And the, the messaging out of the administration was, look, we're not trying to like slow down China's economy or whatever, but like we, we now see the technology that is going to be built on the exact same chips that are being controlled. 
which is going to produce, you know, significant productivity gains for years and years to come, which China, you know, might be able to access through like the cloud in Singapore, but it's, I think, very different. And, and, and you know, one of the really interesting things that has seemed really clear in the way Microsoft and OpenAI are working together is that like, you really need to be deeply integrated with your cloud provider. And there's like a lot of work that is going together between the sort of model development and sort of scaling inference, which is not just something you could hook in halfway across the world with a cloud provider that like already has more than enough business than they can handle dealing with Western clients that they don't have to be stressed out about are potentially violating some export controls, which could really get you in trouble. So even if the, the pain initially with those export controls was sort of only on the margin and yeah, you know, you could, you saw some companies were trying to like rejigger their chips to just get under these thresholds. Now that generative AI is really going to hit in the next coming months and years, it ends up you know, likely having a much larger sort of broader public commercial impact than just the dual use things that the original regulations were ostensibly focused on. Coming back to you, Reva, with the sort of like Cold War stuff, you know, one of the most concerning upsetting lines I saw thinking about whether two particularly concerning things I've seen over the past few weeks, which like raises my expectations that we're going to start to see real retaliation from China is first, you know, all of this reporting, which we've covered on in China talk about uh, the Biden administration, again, telling China not to give arms to Russia. And then this, this one line from some anonymous Chinese government official in the, in the Straits Times, basically saying, the exact same thing that the Chinese government started saying right before it started putting tariffs on in retaliation to the U.S. tariffs back in, what was it, 2017 or 2018, saying, look, we don't want a Cold War, but we're ready to have one. And whatever that ends up meaning is going to, to have a real a real impact and put back some of the things on the table that um, we've been talking about in China talk over the past year that that China, for whatever reason, hasn't decided to deploy to strike back in semiconductors or, you know, any other any other industry. So, you know, any any thoughts, reflections on the sort of risk of the of the tit for tat kicking off in a in a even more dramatic way than it has so far? Things are getting existential really fast, right? I mean, you're already seeing this dynamic in play uh, where the U.S. is very consciously escalating in tech and investment controls, boosting defense support to Taiwan, all these different fronts, knowingly doing that, but saying we need guardrails, right, to prevent this from descending into hot conflict. Beijing's response, not having much leverage here, just given the, the state of its economy and needing to preserve foreign investment, is, oh, you want guardrails? well, come and get it, right? Like it's basically saying, you know, balloon affair, you want your military to military dialogues? Well, you're you're gonna need to de-escalate if you want to get to a more stable state. So we are in a really dangerous phase of the competition. And I don't know if you saw, this was also flagged by Trivium, but there's ICY's um, is a semiconductor research and advisory firm based out of Shanghai. And they, there was a really interesting opinion piece where they did this classification of American chip offenders, right? So there were instigators, which seemed to be alluding to like the big US IC companies that, you know, they talk about preventing the loss of talent and technology, but they actually use their judicial power to suppress competitors, seek their own interests. So that was one class. And then there were what they called wide-eyed wolves. You know, those the, the the memory chip makers that can take advantage of controls and then pawns. And there was a specific reference to Dell, you know, which recently announced that they're going to diversify their sourcing of chips away from from China um, that are basically, you know, trying to to steer out of China, but are, are being forced to from these political controls. And it, the conclusion was you need to create a blacklist for the good companies that are helping China's tech indigenization goals and punish those that are not. Now, in practice, we know that's really hard to do in this economic, in this ge geopolitical climate where China needs all the help it can get. It can't afford to alienate foreign investors in a big way, but there may be some easy targets along the way um, as it's tempted to retaliate. Maybe on that note, because I mean, if, we, if we look at the recent 
or not so recent anymore, the announcement from Volkswagen to have a joint venture with Horizon Robotics for, I think, two and a half billion uh, US dollars. I mean, that certainly should put a smile on China's face uh, because it's it's in, an, in a critical sector. It's by one of the largest foreign companies. Uh, it's, I think, also for Volkswagen, one of the largest investments. But if, the, if we combine that with what you just said before, what does it mean for Volkswagen's competitiveness in autonomous driving down the road when for the China market, Volkswagen most likely does not have the luxury anymore to access generative AI. How risky is it for international companies to agree to joint ventures with the Chinese companies in the area of semiconductors, right? Because it, it seems like there are so many headaches involved in this. Uh, not just on the side of export controls, but also especially if we take into account, can I still be competitive if access to the Chinese market means I have to separate my business in the stuff, let's say Western stuff, that still has access to gen competitive generative AI and the China stuff where I am out of the generative AI ecosystem because I simply cannot, I cannot access it anymore. So I, I feel like for, yeah, I'm just wondering what's the future both for this particular sector, so autonomous driving in China, does it actually stand a chance? Even, even on um, ignoring the generative AI part, you know, non-generative AI, right? China is ahead and visioned in audio networks, you know, by, by a large amount. And if we talk about self-driving, you know, it's, it's most likely not a generative AI model that's running it, right? You know, there is talk about certain types of transformers, but for the most part, those types of models are not, you know, that one. So it's, you know, maybe we're going down this, this one path, path A, where, you know, we're way better at, you know, we as in, the, you know, the Western world is better at generative AI, but the other path, self-driving, does that also get impacted? Well, um, you know, as you mentioned on the, you know, the Horizon robotics chips, you know, the current generation NVIDIA chip shipping in, you know, Mercedes, uh, you know, soon, uh, all the 24 model year Mercedes are going to have this current generation NVIDIA chip for self-driving. The next generation one is actually, I believe it's past the threshold of the export restrictions, right? So, you know, we're talking about 2020, 2022-ish type time frame, you know, training chips. But, you know, this restriction, if it doesn't get moved forward, actually starts impacting their self-driving, right? Assuming NVIDIA is, you know, right on the amount of compute and all that needed to actually run, you know, self-driving. Um, I presume others are going to be down the same path. And if that's the case, then, you know, 2025 year technology is actually going to be, you know, maybe call it 2026 to get implemented in a car is, is restricted. And so that's another, you know, you know, I think there's what, 2 million people who drive for a living in the U S um, we're going to have those people unlocked, right? Is China going to be able to unlock those people for other productive tasks? Yeah, this is, this is the heart of it. This is the heart of the, the October sanctions, like unquestionably. Were those sanctions put in place to limit China's military capabilities, as the document says, or is the intent to cripple China's manufacturing capacity and their whole broader economy? Right? Because it, it's uh, autonomous driving and automotive is, is just one, is the sort of easiest of those to grasp. But if you look at just broadly deploying AI in industrial systems and cars and planes and everything, that's a big, big part of any modern economy, right? Autos are clearly very important to China. And if you take away the ability for them to access leading semiconductor manufacturing processes, that, that's the end of autonomous driving in China, right? Which is the end of China's automotive industry. And so then it's, you're talking about a much, much broader scope of impact for what went down in October. And I, I certainly think everybody in China assumes it's if that's the case. It's not just about you know holding back China's military. It's about holding back China full stop. Think about how insanely frustrating that is for Beijing too, right? Like China is the first mover in NEVs, right, in battery technologies, that's right. and it intent was to go and deploy this to the world, right? But look at the IRA in the U.S. and the extremely stringent provisions that that imposes. Arguably unrealistic, but Treasury will get creative with it in undergoing this transition. Now you've got these ICT rules getting way harsher on top of the October 7th controls. We haven't even talked about biotech, too. You know, that's another area where we're going to see a lot more restrictions. So, yeah, this is an act of degradation in many ways of, of, of China's development, its tech innovation. And there is no easy way to transcend those constraints. Something's got to give here. Oh. 
we're two years away from election year. And, you know, regardless of the ambiguity that may be in these potentially unintended second order effects that were in the October 7 things, I think a Republican president come 2025 is going to look at these types of issues in a much more aggressive way, which, you know, is going to be something that Beijing and, and, and Chinese companies are really going to have to grapple with. Can I be the European here for one second? Because, I mean, yes, it's nice to look at, at everything from the lens of long-term competition with an adversary, but escalating that would also make retaliation from China much more likely and much more severe. Plus, forget all hopes about engaging with China where you actually need it. You as in we need it for climate change. Because it's not just a loss, like having no access to, let's say, the most competitive AI or ICT does not just mean you lose productivity. It also means you lose a chance to have a greener economy, right? So I think in the, not in the next five years, not in the next two elections, but in the long term down the road, I'm wondering if with this focus on competition and looking at every piece of technology through an economic security lens, we are sacrificing making a real way in something that actually matters, which is climate change and global warming. It's interesting, right? Like Europe is dealing still with a war on the continent, right, with Russia. It sees some level of engagement with China as a way to prevent a worst case scenario. But you could argue those same arguments were made around Nord Stream, right? Uh, and that didn't work out so well. But Europe is, is seeing the U.S. escalating at a very rapid clip. So naturally, it's going to want to tap the brakes on it and use economic engagement as a means of doing so. But then that, in turn, compels the U.S. to reach for longer arm provisions, right, to try to steer its partners in place. We've already seen that on logic chip controls, but really interesting to see where the partners are drawing the line to say, no, 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 memory chips, you're going too far there, right? And and Jan Peter and I are working on something now, with, uh, which will be out soon, but we're, we are looking at areas of, in more mature tech nodes, right? And process nodes for where China can compete, where European companies will still be engaged with China in the IC space. So that's going to be an important, interesting point of divergence potentially with the U.S. That's a that's a good point. And I, I want to go back to something JP was talking about before, which was uh, Volkswagen, right? I think it's an interesting case study because I, I don't know if you all remember this, but there was a report for a while that Volkswagen was looking to actually buy the automotive business out of Huawei. There was a rumor going around that they wanted to do that. And then it just it quietly went away. And I always wondered, like, what happened there? Because in the end, I think Volkswagen just hired a bunch of people out of Huawei. And now they're looking to do this deal with Horizon Robotics. Did somebody come to approach Volkswagen and say, hey, that's a really bad idea. Let's, let's stay away from Huawei. Because I think it speaks to the larger question of, you know, we're reaching a point where there will be signs of light in between divergence between what the US and the EU want. Yeah, the action reaction here is really interesting because from Beijing's perspective, it needs to steer its tech champions toward its big priorities, which means they're involved in a lot of stuff from, you know, very benign consumer applications to legitimate, you know, military, civil fusion, dual use type things where the U.S. is going to want to target. And you see in the U.S. how Huawei has been cast as as a bad actor, right? And you're seeing now even tightening restrictions on um, existing controls, right, to with the a policy debate underway on whether to revoke existing licenses to Huawei for, for example, sub 5G components. So, yeah, that makes it hard to to engage with entities like that when the U.S. is going this hard on and against many of them. One assumption I think we've had in our conversation, which isn't necessarily in the law yet, is the idea that Western companies that have really fancy models can't just sell access in China. So right now, OpenAI, it's just like their company policy. But to my understanding, there's no law that says, you know, Facebook or Google or, or Microsoft can't just turn this stuff on within China. So, you know, the question of export controls around these really powerful models is something that I'm really interested in. And if and when they come on, like to what extent you can 
industrial espionage your way past those sorts of controls. All these are are weights. And, you know, that's like a file. That's like a few dozen gigs, it seems to me to be. And, you know, deploying it across an economy of a billion and a half people is a whole nother ball game, which is when you start getting into the chips, the sort of like chip control angle that we've been talking about. But as these sorts of technologies become even more critical and strategic and sort of key to your economic future, is the industrial espionage strategy likely going to be and how how effective could it be to um, get some of the gains that you'd want to have, even if the Western firms just won't sell to you? But I mean, the there the path dependency kicks in, right? Because if you want to deploy, let's say, a cutting edge large language model, you still need high performance AI accelerators to do anything with it. Yeah. Right? So um, in, in that regard, the current controls that are in place would still mean that whatever Google or Facebook or any other hyperscaler want to do in China, it would still be increasingly far behind what they can do outside of China simply because they have they have only access to 2020 AI ac accelerator technology yeah, but, but it doesn't have to be done in China right let's I mean like like Baidu Baidu has I think 2,000 employees in Silicon Valley right so they could easily run all of that on AWS San Jose. They don't have to. They don't have to have a deployment. This is where the those ICTS rules are going to be so interesting to watch, right? Because if there is any nexus, like you can be on a U.S. cloud platform, but if there's a nexus to, you know, Chinese entity of concern that the U.S. wants to target, and there's more protectionism around data sets, you know, for example, as as we start to see this evolve over time. That's going to be really interesting to watch. I want to I want to pick up something that you mentioned before, Jordan. I think because from your take, would it be viable for if we think, for example, of more neutral players in 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 Asia? So let's pick Singapore, right? A, a, a more co compared to a Japan, a more ambivalent uh, and kind of serving both sides attitude between U.S. and China. There were rumors that some of the semiconductor supplier market, so specifically EDA software and equipment suppliers move some of their production to Singapore, specifically for, for the reason to serve the Chinese market. Could that be also viable for, for cloud and AI, where we have suddenly huge service centers in Singapore for Western hyperscalers to serve the Chinese market? Or is that too much of a stretch? Well, I mean, the, the Chinese government I think would have to get over their data security concerns. Um, you know, there's been enormous blowups uh, have taken huge chunks out of the market cap of some of China's leading players because they've been accused of playing fast and loose with uh, sending Chinese citizens data abroad, uh, sort of exposing uh, PRC uh, to national security risk, however much that like, you know, makes sense in a DD context. This is clearly something that people with power and influence in the system have been able to get their way on in policy debates in uh, Jing over the past few years. So to be comfortable with, you know, the Singapore solution, that is a big hurdle to cross. If, you know, you're, you're betting your path to, you know, future productivity growth over the next 10 years on sending like everything out to Singapore and working with, you know, American companies on their cloud servers to that's like a pretty aggressive trust fall, which, you know, maybe come GPT five, once America's growing at 7% because of all this crazy AI, the calculus starts to change. I think you, you probably need to get a little further in the, not just perceived, but like actual gap uh, for the sorts of calculations to really start shifting to allow Chinese firms to access the sort of, uh, you know, to, to put themselves in a situation which like absolutely would not be kosher today. Well, there's a lot of ground to cover, but it's um, covered. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks so much for your part of China Talk, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Always, always pl pleasure. Thank you.